this is called what is repentance. <clears throat> uh, you know, some of the brethren go and say to me, say repentance. And if you say what is repentance, they go, let's turn from your sin. Well, the Bible says God repented several times in the Bible. And he never turned from sin because he never sinned, right? So repentance can't be turned from your sin. I'm sorry. Uh, but that is what that is. That's probably the most thorough. And that is, again, that's a 20, basically a 22-page read. So you could probably finish this in a month. And, um, uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who was reading it to you if they read slow? But, um, uh, anyway, that, uh, that is a good, uh, a good, just a good book on, uh, uh on repentance. <clears throat> and then these, uh, this is the understandable history, the audio book. We have four, uh, three, three books in an audio books. Uh, the understandable history. Uh, this is living with pain. No, my wife did not write this. Okay, if you look at the book, it's only this thick ass, way too thin. She's working on two volumes set called Living with the Pain. But um, uh, Living with Pain, uh, 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 Understandable History of the Bible, and Is the English Bible Inspired? Those, uh, those three books we have in audio books, <clears throat> so they might be a blessing to you. And then this, um, you know, I get a lot of unsolicited material. Uh, and... and it's unsolicited because they, you know, like they'll send me book manuscripts and they'll think, I'm going to read this. He's going to read this and he's going to publish it for me. Well, first off, he's not going to read it. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm working on like four or five books of my own. Uh, and uh, I really don't have time to, to review. But I, one day I reached behind my chair and found a manuscript a guy sent me four years earlier. Read this thing, what you think? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, and so a lot of people give me stuff. And I was in a, I was in a meeting sometime back, several years ago now. And then this lady came up, she said, my son made this. And, and you can have it and do anything you want with it. And it's called Scottish Preachers of Old. And so, like so many things that I get handed, I thought, oh, yeah, this would be great. Uh, well, we had, a, we had a night drive. We had to drive to about oh, 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we started it right off uh, after a Wednesday night service. <clears throat> and I thought, well, we'll be in the RV. We'll just throw it in the RV and we'll listen to a few minutes of it. I am telling you guys, at 1.30 in the morning, my wife and I are going down. I, I think we're taking 40 uh, east across the uh, across Oklahoma, crying. It is tremendous. It is one of the most inspiring things. Uh, just Scottish preachers old. It is a montage uh, of excerpts from Scottish preachers. Preacher was thinking of Scots can know how to do that stuff, and uh, <laughs> this guy did. These guys did. So, um, so those are back there. <clears throat> I told you, Kathy's back there. She will. Uh, uh, she will uh, take your money. She will. Well, it's good to be saved. Always good to be saved, guys. You know, for eight years, every morning you wake up and wonder how how much farther into the into the abyss has our country sunk. And I don't feel like that anymore. I feel like the siege is over. Uh, but you know, guys, here's what I tell guys. Uh, you know, maybe just maybe Trump will save our country from uh, you know from the globalists. But it is going to take it is going to take God's people getting right with Him. To bring revival. Um, you know, if you think that uh, Trump is the answer to everything, you know, one of the most amazing things. I don't know if, uh, uh, have you ever been up to the Cap Capitol Connection there in, in March? But, uh, every March they have this Capitol Connection uh, in uh, in D.C. and we go to it. And um, we have, you, you'd be shocked at how many senators and representatives get up and give a tremendous testimony of salvation. Uh, there's a guy... Uh, Bill Johnson from Ohio, he got saved when he was 11 years old. He said, I saw this kid in my neighborhood. His, his dad and mom were divorced. He's living with his mom. And he said, uh, uh, I, I saw this kid in the neighborhood had candy. And I said, hey, where'd you get the candy? The kid says, the blue bus that picks me up on Sunday gave us candy. He said, well, I want candy. So Sunday morning came. Up, came. He woke his five-year-old sister up, dressed her, dressed himself, never woke their mom up. Went out and caught the bus to church. He got candy. <laughs> And he got Jesus Christ. And, and you know, a politician will like repeat a verse over and over like they're going to fool you into thinking they're Bible scholars. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. I don't even know what that means. Okay. But he just figures if he says that half a dozen times, you go, whoa, he knows the Bible. No, he doesn't. But this, this Bill Johnson I was talking to, uh, he literally, he knew too much Bible to be faking it. He knew, you know, things about the Bible, not just quote a verse or two. Uh, he knew scenarios that take place in the Bible. But here's what I want to tell you. These saved guys get up and saved ladies get up. You know what they all tell us? We, talking about 
Congress, we will never bring revival to this country. It's going to have to be you people in the church. Now they recognize that. And we should recognize that. And, and I know whenever we, rec- when we recognize that, we think all them other churches need to get right with God. But, uh, you know, I just think God's people need to uh, square things away with him and it may help us. Uh, I want you to turn to uh, Luke chapter 1. <clears throat> Gospel of Luke chapter 1. There are some people in the Bible, a lot of men in the Bible that are outstanding. God has paid a lot of attention to them. Uh, they stand out in the crowd, starts a lot with Abram. And, um, you know, you see Abram, he stands out, Jacob stands out. Uh, David was a man after God's own heart. Uh, and, and just generally, there's a lot of people, that, that men, that, that God singles out uh, and draws our attention to him. He says a great deal about him, Samuel. Uh, of course, with a name like that, you expect greatness. But, um, um, but then there are some, there are some men that I, I say, it's kind of their, their greatness is a revelation. In other words... They don't, you know, God doesn't spend a lot of time on them. But if you read your Bible, you go, wow, that guy was something. Uh, I've always thought that uh, Saul's son, Jonathan, uh, he was not one of the most outstanding frontline characters in the Bible, other than being David's friend. Uh, but boy, that guy, uh, he was something. I mean, in, in 1 Samuel 14, uh, he says, uh, he says to his armor bearer, come on, let's just go discover ourselves in Philistine. Let's just go whip them. And I can just see his armor bearer going, okay, I'll wake up the troops. And no, 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 don't wake up the troops. It's you and me. It's, Say what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're just gonna go. Now, now at least if you're if you were the armor bearer, wouldn't you think that your your captain had some kind of a plan for winning? And he says that I think he probably said something to Jonathan like, uh, hey John, uh, what's the plan? How are we gonna whip these guys? Well, I'm not sure. We're just gonna we're just gonna call to them, we're gonna discover ourselves to them, and if they say, Come on up here, we're gonna win. If they say wait till we get down there, I want you to know you've been the best armor bearer. <laughs> And the guy was outstanding. Jonathan, he, there's kind of a revelation uh, of Jonathan being a great man. And there's a guy here in uh, Luke chapter 1 who I am very, very impressed with. And his name is Zacharias. And it says this, uh, verse 1. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia. Uh, and his wife uh, was a daughter of uh, daughters of Aaron. And her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Let's bow our heads. Let's talk to the Lord. Father, fathers, we come to you tonight. I think I speak for these people when I say that we have no problem with you. Because there's just nothing wrong with you. And we have no problem with your Bible because there's nothing wrong with that. Lord, what a winning team. You and the Bible. God, they're just, we, when we come to you, we know that you're never wrong. Nothing you do, no, no advice you give us, no direction you lead us could be wrong. God, when we come to your Bible, we know nothing in it has to be corrected, has to be taken with a grain of salt. It is all your words. It is all perfect. And we thank you for that. Now, God, I know this. If these folks are anything like me, uh, I am the biggest problem that I have. And I'm sure that they are the biggest problem they have, even though they might try to say it's somebody else. Lord God, Zacharias was a great man. And I know that there is a message here tonight. And Lord, you know all the things about me that would prevent these people came on a Monday night uh, that would prevent these people from hearing from you. So God, I ask you, Lord, please, for their sake, get Sam Gipp uh, out of their way and out of your way and speak to the heart of each individual and accomplish your purpose in each life represented. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Now, I want to talk to you about Zacharias tonight because there's just some things. I'll tell you what the, the things that stand up about me first, about him. First, look at verse 5. It says this. Now, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias. Notice he was not the high priest. Right? This is just a certain priest. This is just one of the sons of Levi, one of the sons of Aaron. Uh, and he was just one of the guys. You have the high priest. The high priest, by the way, at this time uh, was not Annas or Ananias, and it was not Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the son of Ananias. Ananias was deposed as the high priest. Uh, in a few chapters here, it calls Ananias and Caiaphas both of being high priest. But that's because he, you know how uh, an ex-president, they always address him as Mr. President. And, uh, you know, if he's an ex-ambassador, uh, they always address him as ambassador. But in, in 15 AD, uh, Ananias was uh, deposed and his son Eliezer 
uh, became the high priest, and he was priest for two years, 16 and 17. Uh, and then in 18 uh, uh, AD, uh, Caiaphas took over, and this is somewhere around seven. So this is this is still uh, An Ananias. He's the um, the high priest here, uh, and it says, um, but he said he was a certain priest. You know what that means? Nothing special about it. I mean, he's just one of the guys, right? One of the regular guys. He's always there. He's just one of the certain guys, just a certain priest. And, and I don't know about you. You know, a lot of, I know a lot of people. Uh, there's nothing special about them. Uh, and it's not a bad thing. You know, everybody thinks they're special. I got news for you. I hate to tell you this. You're not. You really need to be told that because we get a whole generation that is told from this big, you're special. How can you tell a kid that's three years old he's a champion when he's done nothing? <laughs> What's he a champion at? Sleep? Man, we had a couple of them. They weren't even champs at death. They weren't even competitors for the, for the award, all right? But the fact is, guys, that, that it was a certain priest, uh, and he just went and did his thing, uh, and he came home. And I will guarantee you, if God had not stepped into this guy's life in this chapter, you'd have never heard about him. You know, I know, because you haven't heard about any other priest. You don't know any of the name of any other priest at this time. Isn't that true? And so he was a certain priest. He showed up to do his job, and he's in there one day. And look what it says, um, verse uh, 7. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren. And they both were, were now well stricken in years. Now, who knows what, how old that is? That come into play later in the message. But um, uh, they were well stricken in years. And it doesn't even, you know, well stricken doesn't even mean that you're necessarily old. You know, some folks are old at 20. Just check it. But, um, I mean, you know, you ever meet, I mean, you ever meet some people, it's like they can't get old fast enough? Brother, not me. I was telling, I think I was telling one of the guys last night, uh, uh, I was telling a guy on the phone today, uh, I, I, I heard about this guy who was 105 years old, and they asked him, did I define when you live to be 100? Uh, first off, when you live to be 100, every birthday after you're from starting with your 100th birthday, you wake up every morning surrounded by idiots. You do, because every morning, every birthday, you're going to have somebody from the local paper or the radio or the TV going, oh, how did you live to be this long? Which, well, the truth, they didn't die. That's how they lived to be that long. I mean, they had nothing to do with it. I mean, some of these guys, you know, they've been pork grinds and, and hog fat and smoking all their life. Going, I don't know. I just did it. And this guy was 105 years old. They said, how do you live to be 105? And he said, well, after you're 100, you got to be real careful. <laughs> Man's my inspiration. I said, boy, you know, I'm shooting for 105. When I get to 100, I am slowing down. <laughs> but um, but they were well stricken. So so however old they were, uh, the age, the years were hard on them. Uh, you know, you see some folks, they're just, they're young, but they got, uh, they've been stricken by, uh, by age, by years. And verse 8, it says, it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God, in the order of his course, According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fell upon, uh, and, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah. And for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth uh, shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, uh, and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall, shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, uh, to turn the hearts of the fathers uh, to the children and the disobedient, to the wisdom of the just, to make ready the people, uh, a people prepared for the Lord. Uh, and Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I'm an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. The angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel. Now, let me, let me insert something here about Gabriel. Nothing to worry about from Gabriel. You know, there's only two names given in heaven uh, of, of angelic beings, uh, Gabriel and Michael. There is no angel Raphael, okay? But, uh, but there's Gabriel and Michael. And if you study your Bible, here's what you find out. Gabriel, if God had to deliver a message, an audible message, he said, Gabriel, he's the talker. But you already knew that. Because when somebody talks a lot, you say, they're Gabby. 
Or what are you guys doing? We're just gabbing. That's where it comes from. Okay, that's why we say Gabby, and that's why we, we put Gab uh, for talking, because Gabriel was the talker. And so, so you know, if, if when Gabriel shows up, somebody's going to be told something. Look at Daniel. It's Gabriel that goes and talks to Daniel. It's Gabriel that comes and shows up and talks to Mary, because he's the guy that delivers the message. Michael is the only one called the Archangel, and Michael is kind of like the George S. Pat of, he of heaven. I mean, if Michael shows up, somebody's going to die. That is all there's to it. So, you know, all these people go, you know, an angel was glowing in my bedroom last night. Hey, if an angel ever glows in your bedroom, ask him his name. If he says, Michael, cancel tomorrow's plans. <laughs> I mean, the only thing, he, the only message he says is, die. That's it. And so Gabriel shows up, <clears throat> verse 19, and the angels uh, answering said to him, I am Gabriel, and stand in the presence of God, and am sent there it is to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, watch, thou shalt be dumb. Uh, and not able, that doesn't mean he's going to be a Democrat, okay? Yeah. That means unable to speak, which would be nice. Uh, in, anyway, and uh, uh, and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because I believe it's not my words, uh, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Now, here's the exchange. The angel shows up, and, and he says, I'm Gabriel. And he says, I want to let you know that you and your wife are going to have a son. He's going to name him John. And he's going to be the precursor. He's going to go out in the spirit and power of Elijah. And he is, going to, he is going to be the precursor to the Messiah. Now, I don't know what father wants their kid to be great, but I would say that's pretty great. He's so great, in fact, that when the Lord talks about him in John chapter 11, he said, there's been nobody greater born of woman. That is the greatest guy that's ever walked this earth. The greatest sinful man, not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was not... Uh, born of flesh, he was not sinful. Um, but, but you know, now come on, guys, don't you sometimes doubt the Lord? Surely you doubt the Lord. And he just was, you know, say, hey, what are you talking about, man? I'm old, my wife is old, my wife's really old. And, uh, you know, how are we going to have kids? And he's okay, you're not going to be able to speak until this happens. Now, let me ask you a question. If you go to work tomorrow and, like, halfway through work, suddenly you just can't talk. You know what I got a feeling you're going to do? Aren't you going to go, like, uh, if you got some kind of a first aid station, or you're going to say, look, I go to your boss, hey, I'm going to the, I'm going to the ER, you know? I mean, would you do that? Watch this guy. He loses his voice. And watch this. 21. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he carried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he'd seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them uh, and remained speechless. Now watch this. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. You know what? I, I think this guy's great because God's work, his work was to just, just burn the incense in the temple, correct? And God's work was more important than his physical inconvenience. You know, we've got people today, I hope there's none here, that think that their birthday is a national holiday. I know all kinds of people that say, this is my birthday, I'm calling off work. Well, who do you think you are? I mean, why, why do you think your birthday's a national holiday? You think you're so important. Uh, and here's a guy, you know, if you have some kind of a physical problem, you go, well, man, it only makes sense. I'm going to go to the doctor. I'm going to go to the infirmary. I'm going to go to the clinic because I got a problem. And we would stop work in the middle of the day and we would take ourselves to the ER and we would say, I've got a problem. This guy's got a physical problem. You know what he said? I'm here to do a job for God. God gave me a job to do. And whether I got a physical problem or not, I'm going to do the job. You know, I meet a lot of folks, and they have some physical problems. Uh, and I know they probably mean well when they say this. They'll go, well, you know, I'm, I'm working on this, and I'm working on that. He said, as soon as I feel good, I'm going to do something for God. You know, I tell them, if you're going to wait till you feel good, you're never going to do anything. If you're going to wait until, you know, I feel like working today, and, and you know, I feel well today. Guys, there's, you know, don't hold your breath till you feel well. Because after a few years, I don't think you ever feel well again, okay? I mean, it's kind of like, I, I tell folks, I said, for some people, I don't want to spread this too far, but for some people, a positive cancer uh, uh, diagnosis is not necessarily bad news. <laughs> it's just a ticket out of this place and we leave this uh, all behind us. But the fact is that, that Zacharias, he was there to do a job for God, and he here he has a physical problem now that he cannot speak, but he said, you know what? I don't need my voice to do this. So I'm going to do my job for God. God's God's work was more important than his physical problems. You know, it, it was um, 2008. They they went in on this side. Uh, in 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 73, they uh, used bone uh, and fused six and seven when it broke my neck. 
Uh, and then in 08, they, the C4 and 5 had collapsed, and so they took C5 out uh, and ground it up to powder, put it in a titanium cage, put it back in between 4 and 6, and put a titanium plate on here. I got a titanium plate right here in my neck. I live for the day the Muslims try to cut off my head. I just want to, and now we're going to cut off your head. That you can. I told you. But, but I tell I, and, and, But then there's, a, there's another side of that, and it is I don't care what you think. I have medical proof. My head is screwed on straight. <laughs> but you know, here's the problem. When they do that surgery, uh, sometimes kind of that surgery, unable to speak. I told you, your vocal cords can, can totally paralyze and never speak again. Now, here's our problem in our, in our society, especially open heart surgery is not, it is not insignificant surgery, correct? But because it is so popular, because it is so common, we don't think of it as being so, so dangerous. You know, I tell people, I said, when they use power tools this far from your spinal cord, believe me, it's important. And, um, and so, uh, they're, they're going to do this surgery. I'm laying in bed the night before they're going to do this surgery in 08. And, uh, and the guys, you know, the guy gave the warning. It's kind of like, the, it's kind of like the, the warning label on everything that you buy. And he said, now, look, there's a chance you come out of here paralyzed from the neck down, never able to move again. Uh, there's a chance you come out of here never able to speak. There's a chance both could happen. And so I remember laying on my back, uh, and I'm thinking, I'm going into surgery in a few hours. And I, I really didn't think I was going to come out paralyzed. I didn't think I was going to come out unable to speak, no matter how somebody prayed. But... Um, but you got to prepare for it. So here's what I did as I laid on that bed that night. I prayed for every preacher I knew. I went down the list. I, I, I laid in that bed wide awake, and I thought of every, and the guys, believe me, I know a lot of preachers. And I prayed for, uh, I have a three-line uh, three, uh, prayer. I say, God bless their marriage, their ministry, and their health. And I asked God to bless the marriage, the ministry, and health of every preacher that I knew. And when I got done, Here's what I said to the Lord. I said, okay, Lord, I just did something that I didn't need to move and I didn't need to speak to do. So if I come out of this surgery tomorrow, unable to speak and unable to move, I already got something to do. I know what I can do. Well, they haven't got that prayer since. <laughs> but it was just practice. And what I'm saying, guys, is, you know, we get this idea. God calls you to do something. God tells you to do something. I, I love people that go, God wants me to teach Sunday school. And then they get mad at a preacher and they're gone and they never teach Sunday school again. What happened? What, what, what happened to work of God? I know people that they take on a missionary. You know, we Catholicize sports missionaries and they take on a missionary on a monthly basis. Uh, and then they get mad to leave the church and somehow they think that the missionary no longer needs the money. What happened? Well, you know, we just had a little problem. Well, so you had a little problem. I mean, well, come on, you're going to get through life without having a problem? Everybody has a problem. And a lot of people have physical problems, all right? You say, well, well what should I do? You ought to do the work of God. I can't get over how many people just showed up for church. Well, you know, I, I just didn't feel very good. Are you kidding me? You know, I, I, I tell people, read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible. And I tell them, read 10 pages a day. You know that. And, um. Uh, I'll say, read a proverb for the date in 10 pages a day. And ladies, I want you to know that I have never had a woman come up and say this to me. It has been a man after man after man after man. And they come up and they go, you know, when I read 10 pages a day, I get a headache. <laughs> I don't know if they want me to hold their hand, you know. I thought, why don't you go tell your mom that? She's the one that's interested. And... um. Uh, and they go, oh, I get a headache. What do you think I should do? And I go, oh, it's easy. Read it with a headache. You would think, you ought to see the look on their face. It is like I cussed them. <laughs> I mean, they just can't imagine that somebody would say, do what you're supposed to do, even with a headache. I mean, is the headache, oh, well, I have a headache. I didn't go today. I didn't go to work. And, and I have a headache. Look, I'm going to tell you guys something. I got a headache in November of 2015. And I've had that headache every day to this day. That is like 15, 16 months, every single day. My head is, I, I, I dream about pain. I told my wife the other day, I am, I'm, I'm laying in bed and, and my head is hurting so bad. And then I realized that I wasn't, I wasn't awake, but I was dreaming that I was laying in bed with a headache. <laughs> 
And, uh, and, and that's what happens. You say, what do you do? I read 30 pages of my Bible every day. I read a proverb for the day, 20 pages of the Old Testament, 10 pages of the New, and I do it with a headache. You say, why? Because the work of God is more important than your stupid headache. And it's, a, it's more important than your sore toe, and it's more important than your hurt feelings. And here's this guy, his job. He went to, I mean, come on, man. All he had to do is light incense. I mean, this was not like a high-tech job. Not rocket science. We were in um, Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk, Virginia. And there was a, a young man there that uh, I've known him since his 20s. He, he went to um, Embry-Riddle uh, School for Aviation. And, uh, and he's, he was at, actually, he's working for NASA making rocket nozzles, designing rocket nozzles. And Kathy and Nathan and Luke went up to sing. And, and, and Kathy kind of lowers this microphone stand and, and has it about this high, but it won't tighten. It keeps falling down in. Well, so Nathan, you know, the man, walks over, and, and he can't get his work. And it won't. And so the pastor, he's an ex-Marine. He just came up and shot it. <laughs> anyway, um, he comes up, and, and nobody gets this mic stand. To, 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 and I'm telling you, this, this NASA kid walks up, and he goes like this. And it was done. And he went, sit down. I said, that is proof it does take a rocket scientist. <laughs> I mean, yeah, he said, it don't take a rocket scientist. Did, did for that. But guys, I mean, is it rocket science like incense? <clears throat> I mean, you know, there are some things. You know, cooking is a little tougher than just lighting incense. You probably can tell when it's not lit. And that's all you have to know. Is it lit? Is it not lit? Tough job. So it doesn't seem like much of a job. There's enough for him to just stay right there and do it no matter what his problem was. It might not be important in your eyes. It might not be important in anybody else's eyes. But you know something? It was his job to do. And he was going to see to it that he did it. Man, I was watching a guy over at the church uh, uh, up there in Boise. And, uh, man, it was snowing and snowing and snowing. He's out there, man. He is out there pushing snow and shoveling snow and plowing snow. And, I mean, ran out of places to put it. And then it's coming down five minutes after he's done it. And he just... Brother, he, was his, he said, my hands were freezing, my toes were freezing. You know what he's doing? He's doing his job. Plowing snow. Couldn't even go into the service that night because he was plowing snow all night. Everybody thinks, well, that's just some guy plowing snow. Yeah, it is, but it was God's work for him. And what I'm telling you guys, you know, we all say this, God, tell me what you want me to do. And then if he does, you're like a, a high-velocity bullet hitting, a, hitting stainless steel on an angle. Uh, the first time something happens, you bounce off, never to return again, never to be seen again. You say, I want God I, I want God to show me what to do. God shows you what he wants you to do. And then one little thing, I just, I didn't come that day because I wasn't feeling very good. That's all it took? Let me ask you something. There's not much to light in incense, but if he'd have left and gone home early, who'd have lit the incense? So here, I like this guy because Zacharias thought that, that, that God's work was more important than his physical uh, inconvenience. Uh, look at um, verse 57. Now Elizabeth, Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, uh, and she brought forth a son. And her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had uh, showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they called his name Zacharias after the name of his father. And his mother answered and said, Not so, but he should be called John. And they said to her, There is none in thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to his father. Now, is this not, that's how you know the Bible's word of God. When somebody can't talk, can they hear? Yeah. But did you ever notice, like, if, if somebody can't talk, you talk louder? Yes. So the guy can't talk, and they're going, you know, they're, they're like doing sign language. It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, you hear about that guy, you know, he, 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 had a, he had a flat tire right outside the insane asylum. I can't say that anymore, can I? Insane asylum, I'm sorry. Uh, Democratic headquarters. And, um... <laughs> Uh, and, and the guy pulls the, the lug nuts off, and he puts the spare on, and he, and he tips the hub cap over there, all ran right down the manhole cover. Right down the storm drain. And he goes, oh, man, what am I going to do? And inside the nut house, this guy goes, well, why don't you take one lug nut off each one of the car tires? And he said, you have four on those, you have three on that one, and you can drive to a gas station, and, and, and then you can get uh, five new lug nuts. The guy goes, well, that's really a good idea. And he puts them on, he goes, oh, he goes, man, why are you in here? He says, I'm here because I'm crazy, not because I'm stupid. <laughs> I can say, Zachariah, if he could talk, he'd say, I can't talk, I can hear. 
I love it. They made signs to his father how he would have him called. And he asked for a writing table and wrote saying his name is John. And they all marveled. His mouth was open immediately and his tongue loosed. And he spake and praised God. Do you know, uh, I have looked in this Bible. You know I've never found ever. I have. Now I don't know if this was a, ever a Jewish thing. You know, in our a society, a lot of times a father, he wants his first son to be named after him. I don't find anybody in the Bible, son, ever named after his father. I think David had 10 sons. None of them ever named David Jr. Jacob didn't name any Jacob. And Jacob was a proud man. I don't find anybody in the Bible. So, so here's a guy named Zacharias. Why would they expect him to, his son to be named Zacharias? Why would they expect that? But they did expect that, did they not? You know what I think? I think Zacharias wanted his son named Zacharias. I mean, why does a father name his son after himself? Because he wants him to have his name. My brother, my older brother, was named after my dad. He was the junior in the family. And, and so here was Zacharias. And you know what? Probably he taught for years. And he said, oh, yeah, you know, I, I always thought me and Elizabeth would have a son, you know. And, and, and I always just want a boy named after my, me, and I'd name him Zacharias. But it doesn't look like it's ever going to happen because I'm old and she's old and we're just never going to have a kid. And I'll bet you time again, I'll bet you all of his friends knew. You know what Zacharias always wanted? He always wanted a son named after him. It wasn't a Jewish tradition, but this guy wanted that. And so he gets the son, and what happens? He's got to name him John because that's what God wanted him named. You know what that tells me? To, to Zacharias, God's choice was more important than his own desire. Amen. You know, there's a lot of people that will reject God's choice for their own desire. People will say, God, tell me what to do. God tells them what to do, and they'll go, but this is what I want to do. Hey, did you ever stop and think about this? It was Paul's desire to go to Israel. His heart, his burden was what? For his own people, the Jews. You know what God said? I want you to go to the Jews. You're going to the dogs. You're going to the Gentiles. Doesn't say that Paul didn't like the Gentiles, but he but he had such a burden for his own people. He wanted to go to his own people. He said, Man, I would love to go to my own people. And and God said, Yeah, I know that's your desire, but 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 my call, my choice is more important. And so I appreciate this man because he finally had a son. Wouldn't you think I've, I'm gonna have one kid? Maybe we'll name him Zacharias John. And we'll just call him John by his middle name. No. Nope. God said his name's gonna be John. I don't know if they ever had any more children or not. I know this, no record of ever, any ever being a Zacharias Jr. being born. And so as much as it must have meant something to him, God's choice was more important than the desire that he had of having a son that was named after him. Look at verse um, 80. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, was in the deserts, Till the day of his showing unto Israel. Do you know what it took to be a priest? You had to be a Levite. You had to be of the, of the, of the tribe of Aaron. I mean, you had to be one of Aaron's kin folks. Not everybody got in there. It wasn't, it wasn't something where they, 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 you know, you filled out a job application and they, they chose you. If you weren't of the, of, the fam, of the household of Aaron, you could not be a priest. Isn't that right? So, you know, who all of the, all of the men... Out of that household, Aaron's family line, they were predestined to be priests. And you know, at least at least Zachariah said this, he's going to be a son, and he's going to be a priest like his dad. And you know what he ends up doing? He waxed strong and was in the deserts till the day of his showing. God's call, which was to be the forerunner of Jesus Christ, God's call was more important than following in daddy's footsteps. Well, I've talked to some Christian men and they had a business, some kind of a business, be it a bakery or a mechanic shop or whatever it was. And, and uh, they all say, you know, uh, I want my kid to serve God, but I want him to take over the business after me. And then the kid comes and says, Dad, God called me to the mission field. And Dad says, look, I want you to serve God, but I want you to, <laughs> you got to take this job over for me. I'm sorry, Dad, I can't do that. You know that the Borden's Dairy that was a, that was a, uh, uh, the family, they were, they were multimillionaires. They had Borden milk and all kinds of dairy products. Uh, and the one Borden son that was destined to take the dynasty got saved and God called to be a missionary in Africa. 
And he had to tell his whole family, guys, I know, I know that I'm the board and I'm supposed to be the next guy to take over the presidency of this company, but, but God's called me to go to Africa. And the guy was on his way to Africa on shipboard, died, never made it to Africa in life. But he still did what God wanted him to do. And you can bet his family never understood it because you say, well, yeah, lost people wouldn't. I've met a bunch of saved people have. There are a bunch of people. You know, I had a, uh, you know we don't, we don't uh, baptize children or, or put them in some kind of a covenant, but we do dedicate them to the Lord just because we want them, we want them to glorify God with their lives. And I had this couple in my church, and they were like, uh, she, she came like once a month, and he came like maybe, the, you know, the C&E, Christmas and Easter. That was his big deal. Uh, and they had this baby. And so he comes to church one day and he says, we want to dedicate our daughter to the Lord. I said, do you? He goes, yeah. Okay. I said, well, I made it. I said, we'll do this uh, next Sunday night. Will you be here? Yep. And I said, um, I said, we'll uh, do- dedicate your daughter to the Lord. And he said, okay. Now, he did no, he had no idea. The trap I had laid for him. And so uh, he called all of his family. I mean, his, ma- his mom, his brothers, his sisters. I mean, the whole heritage was there, you know, before service that night. And so I said, uh, guys, I said, I, t- I told the two of them, I said, now, uh, I-, I usually talk to the parents just before the dedication. So I said, uh, come in the office for a second. They're sitting there, and he's just all smiling. I said, now, you're going to dedicate your daughter to the Lord tonight, right? Yes, I said. So that means that you're, because she's going to be the Lord's and not yours, you're, it is your responsibility to have her in church every Sunday from now on, right? And and, and I could watch when I said that, the color began to rise, you know. And I wasn't even done with him. And I said, I said, well, because, hey, I mean, if it's God's child, you better have God's child in church. And I said, and if your daughter grows up and marries a missionary and God wants her to go halfway around the world and you never see her again, you're willing to do that, right? Oh, man. I'm saying if he, if he could, if he didn't have his family, I'm sure he'd have walked out. But he knew I had him. I mean, he was, you could have put a fried egg, an egg on top of his head and a fried brother. I mean, he was hot. And he knew I had him. And I knew I had him. So I just potted it real good. Uh, and, and then we went and dedicated that girl and never saw him for again. You say, oh, you ran him off? I didn't run him off. Isn't that, hey, let me ask you something. When you dedicate a child to the Lord, isn't that, doesn't that child belong to God? Then if God, then isn't it your responsibility that you have that child in church every time? Right. And, and if God wants that child to be a preacher or marry a preacher and go halfway around the world, aren't you supposed to say, thank God? Right. And you go, yeah, but if they go halfway around the world, they can't take over my business. That's right. But God's call is more important than following daddy's footsteps. Right. You know what he thought? Oh, I'm going to see him. I'm going to see him. Remember Eli? Samuel wasn't his son, but you know, remember Samuel showed up with a little ephod, you know, looked like a Halloween suit, you know. He had like dressed up like a priest, and, and don't you know that was something for Eli to see? And 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 maybe Zacharias thought, well, you know, I'll have me a son someday. His name will be John Jr., and he'll be right there beside me. I'll take him in and, and I'll show him how to light the incense, and I'll show him the art of lighting incense because there's a there's a knack to it. Because everybody's got something to do, they got finesse to it. And you know what we found out? God's, it was God's, God's, God's uh, work was more important than his physical inconvenience. God's choice was more important than his desire. And God's call was more important than following his daddy's footsteps. Now, I want you to look at, um, uh, oh, I want to show you this. Verse 80. And he was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. I told you we were over in Israel a few years ago. And we went down to Masada. Which is down, you know, the, the, the famous place where the Jews died uh, fighting the Romans. And, um, and on the way down there, where it goes down, you go down the east coast of the Dead Sea. And of all things, man, there's a sign that says Quamran Community. Quamran Community are, are the caves where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I deal with manuscripts, and I thought, oh, man, that's so cool. So we in there. And, and the, the Quamran Community was a religious community of, of very zealot Jews. And they were the Essens, E-S-S-E-N-E-S. Uh, and the Essens were kind of uh, a little bit ascetic, a little stoic, you know. Uh, they lived out there. They kind of got away from, from, from the, the, the hustle and bustle of, uh, of humanity, kind of like Mennonites or, or Amish people would be to us. Uh, they kind of got out of the busy society, and they just dedicated their lives to Christ. 
Uh, now, I don't know if this is true or not, but it is in the middle of the desert. Qumran is, I mean, there's, it's surrounded by desert. And there's a teaching that when John was in the desert, that, that, he, that he was with, he studied with the essence. Well, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But I know this, he was in the desert. What do you think? What do you think went through Zachariah's mind? I mean, don't you think there were times when he's lighting that incense? And he's thinking, that boy, he's, 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 he should be out in here helping me. Man, I, wish I, I just wish I had my son here. Oh, he's 30 today. You know, this is the day, he's 30, man. This is when he would be, he would just start doing this as an official job. And his official job did start down at the Jordan River that day. But he never got to see him. He was gone. And I'm saying that Zacharias, if anybody had, I have a dream. Hey, can I help you young people? Get rid of a dream. You, know, you just need to have a dream. No, you don't. You don't need a dream. Get rid of your dream. It stinks anyway. Okay? Let me tell you the difference between a visionary and a dreamer. Because the whole, our whole population, our young people are said, you need to have a dream. No, you don't. You need to have a vision. The difference between a visionary and a dreamer, when a visionary, if he accomplishes what he has a vision to do, other people benefit from it. A man named Edison had a vision to make electric lights. And we all benefited from his vision coming to, coming to reality. Isn't that true? Two brothers in Ohio had a vision to make something heavier than air fly. And we have all benefited from the Wright brothers' vision. Isn't that true? When a visionary accomplishes his vision, everybody else benefits from it. You, When a dreamer, if he ever accomplishes his dream, it's usually a movie and he's the star. He's the one that happens to be at the bank and, and uh, throws the, the bank robber down on the ground. And, uh, and he's the hero of the day. Dreamers always are the center of their own dreams. And if their dream ever comes true, somehow they're just the greatest person on the planet. And so we got a whole generation told, you need to have a dream. No, you don't. No, your dream is what's keeping you from reality. And maybe this guy had a dream. It wasn't a selfish dream. He just wanted a son named after him. Just wanted to follow in his footsteps, that's all. And he never got any of it. And then take a look at this. Look at uh, chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. And when, when Herod hears that Jesus is, is out there and was working miracles, it says this in verse 7. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by him. Talking about the Lord. And he's perplexed because that it was said of some that John was risen from the dead. And of some that Elias had, had appeared. And of others that one of the old prophets uh, was risen again. And Herod said, John, have I beheaded? But who is this? Of whom I hear such things. And he desired to see him. Now, the Bible says that, that, that Zacharias and Elizabeth were well stricken in years in Luke chapter 1, correct? And this has got to be at least 31 years, 30, 31 years later. So maybe Zacharias wasn't alive. And then again, a lot of guys lived to be 100. Maybe he was. So, so what do you think? I mean, he hears about his kid. My son's 30 years old. He ought to be stepping into the, into the temple today and taking over my job. And I heard he's down there. I mean, he's running around. He's eating locusts. And he's wearing camel's hair. He's like some kind of nut. And then you hear somebody comes and says, Zacharias, have you heard about your son? Huh? You remember the way he dresses? Mm hmm. Oh, no, Zacharias, that's not what we're talking about. Well, he eats strange, too. He thinks that he thinks he can't have anything but uh, locusts and wild honey. Yeah, that's not with me neither. Then you haven't heard? No. Herod killed him last night. They went down to the jail cell and they took your son. That boy would never see 32 years old. Why do you think Zacharias felt? You know what parents aren't supposed to do? They aren't supposed to bury their kids. No parent's supposed to bury his kids. I was talking to, to Don Green. Don Green has had a daughter die of cancer and a, and a a son died of cancer. And he's standing by the grave. And he says, this is, this is not how it's supposed to work. They're supposed to stand by his grave. Our children are supposed to bury us. We're not supposed to bury our children. 
You know, maybe, uh, well, I'll tell you this. When John died, the story ends right there for John, doesn't it? I mean, Zacharias is not going to get any more news about his son. His head's been taken off and he's been buried. And he could look back over from the time he was in that temple and Gabriel showed up. He got his son, but nothing was like he thought it should be. Is that not true? And in every turn, every time it came to something that was important to Zacharias, God's will overruled Zacharias' will. And Zacharias' will, I don't know, was necessarily a bad will. I don't think it's bad that a man wants his son named after him. I don't think it's bad that a man wants his son to follow his footsteps, okay? But at least he wants to live a long life. And he sat down. He thought, my goodness, my boy's dead. I'm retired. I've been out of there. I quit when I was 50. I'm done. My boy's dead. You know what I think sometimes? I think sometimes we've heard this, have we not? We hear it from the mouth of Jesus Christ when he's in the garden just before he's arrested. When I think of Zacharias, I think maybe Jesus wasn't the first one to say the words, not my will, but thine be done. If there is anything that epitomizes the life of Zacharias, wouldn't that phrase be it? Everything in his life, everything about his son, nothing went the way he thought it should, but it all went the way God wanted it to. Isn't that true? And so this guy, all he could do is look up to God and say, I didn't want it to go it this way. I wouldn't be my son. I wouldn't be John. I wouldn't be a, I wouldn't be a priest with me. And, and I want him to, I want to be by my bedside as I died. But none of that happened. But not my will, but thine be done. And what he found was God's will was more important than Zachariah's happiness. No, no, John didn't have any, any grandkids for him. Not John and the kids are coming over today. Nope, never happened. Zacharias Jr. and his kids are coming over today. Never, never happened. happened. You know, guys, we say we want God to deal with us. We, we say serving God could be the greatest thing that could ever happen to us. But then if it doesn't go the way we think it should, we're not too keen on it. But let me tell you, I think this was a great man because at every turn in a road, that road always made the turn that Zacharias would not have made. But Zacharias, you don't find one thing wherever he resisted God. He just said, okay, God, that's what you want. Okay, God, kind of hard to swallow, but that's what you want. And then he brought him word, hey, Zacharias, your son is dead. Okay, God, if that's what you want. Not my will, but thine be done. Guys, if we could say that about everything in our life, we would do well when we pass from this earth, wouldn't we? I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed. Your heads bowed, your eyes closed. In just a moment, I'm going to have a word of prayer when I'm done and can't play. Let me ask you a question. I, I, don't, I, I think, you know, when I preach to you folks, I think I'm talking to folks who pretty much want to serve God, want to glorify Him with their lives. 